All right, folks, well, welcome in to a special Monday night uh, video broadcast, whatever you want to call it. Hope you are doing well. <clears throat> and I put out a, uh, a post today earlier about uh, doing a video and what you guys wanted to hear. See, I've got a, a tripod, a little, little stand set up, so if it's a little shaky or something at first, forgive me. Uh, but I've got a new setup here. But anyway, good to see everybody out. We are. Uh, I got a lot of suggestions on what to do, and I'm going to be. I'm home for two weeks. Okay, I've been traveling like a wild man, and so I'm home for two weeks. And so I'm going to be doing some more of these videos uh, the next two weeks or so. But one that I have been wanting to do, I have thought about doing, and somebody commented was the fact of doing. You're know, talking about the local ver church versus the universal church or whatever. Okay, so we're going to talk tonight about the local church versus the universal church. And so like and share this video. We're going to be looking exactly what the Bible says. And let me say this. I believe in a local church, okay? I believe that there are local assemblies of believers that are called churches. But I also believe in what's called a universal church. Some guys don't like that terminology, universal church, whatever, universal, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. I know Brother Hickam, Caleb Hickam calls it a heavenly church. Whatever you want to call it, I believe that the body of believers, every saved person, regardless of your denomination, regardless if you've been water baptized, if you are saved, you are part of the church, okay? The universal body of believers, okay? And so we're going to look at that tonight. Now, the reason why I'm doing this video is because there is a group of people who are Baptist. Uh, some of them call themselves Baptist Briders, and maybe you've heard of them, you know, the Baptist Brider crowd. There's a whole large plethora, uh, you know, there's a, a big spectrum of who believes what and all that. And I'm not going to get into the different factions of the Baptist Brider movement or anything like that. But what we are going to look at is why I firmly believe and stand and preach that there is a universal church, okay? Now, I know some of you aren't going to like that terminology, but that's the terminology I'm going to use tonight uh, because it's, number one, it's familiar. Number two, I'm used to saying it, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through and say, now listen, a lot of your house guys, not all of them, but a lot of your house guys, a lot of your um, uh, guys, a lot of guys out west, not all of them, but some of them, uh, you know, a lot of them actually, are going to believe in this only local churches, only local church. There's only going to be a local church, and, and there is no universal body of Christ. And some of them even go so far as to say, if you're not baptized in this church, you can't be a member. So you've got to be baptized in this church in order to become a member of this church. I mean, I, I know uh, one individual was baptized like five or six times because whenever they would change churches, they went to another brighter church, they would make them get re-baptized in that church, Okay. So anyway, we're going to look at this tonight. We're going to study the universal church versus the, uh, versus the local church only, okay? So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how the Bible uses the terminology church because there are about... Now, I got this from Chad Reese, and it's good stuff, uh, what I'm about to give you. There are five basic uses of the word church in the Bible, okay? Five different uses. Now, there is no mention of the word church in the Old Testament, none. Now, in the New Testament, there are five different ways the word church is used. The first mention of it is Acts 7.38. Or not the first mention, but the first way it's used. Acts 7.38, talking about Israel, the church in the wilderness. Okay, Israel is called the church in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7, verse number 38. Now, anybody with one eye and half a brain would never think that there was, it was a New Testament church. Right, The New Testament hadn't even begun. So the word, every time you see the word church, that does not mean it's a body of saved individuals, baptized individuals, okay? In no way, shape, or form. Because we see the second time the word church is used, or the second usage of it, is talking about pagan assemblies. In Acts chapter number 19, you find the word church used, and it's in reference to the churches of Diana. Those are obviously not saved, baptized, called out believers meeting in a local assembly, okay? That's in reference to pagan assemblies. Then you have what we would call, or what I would call the universal church or the body of Christ, 
We'll be looking at that a little bit more specifically here in just a little bit. But Ephesians chapter 1 talks about it and Colossians chapter 1 talks about it. That the body of Christ is the church. Not the church is. But if you're a part of the body of Christ, if you're saved, then you are part of the church. Then you've got the next usage of it. You've got the glorified church or the church triumphant, all right? When we come together, there's, you know, I would cross-reference that over with Hebrews chapter 12, the church of the firstborn and all that kind of stuff. When we get to heaven, he presents himself a glorious church, all right? Without spot or wrinkle. That's over there in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. And then we find the local church. Now, I believe in the local church. I'm sitting in a local church, all right? Bible Baptist Church, the church I pastor. We are a local assembly of believers. So we believe in the local church, all right? So what I want to do is I want to go through and I want to show you, first of all, how the Bible does teach local churches. There are local churches. First of all, go to Romans chapter 16. Look at Romans chapter number 16. And verse number 16, Romans chapter 16 and verse number 16. Now, this is a favorite one for the church of Christ. They teach that this is what you know, shows them their denomination. But this, is, this is, does not mention the, the church of Christ. But notice in Romans 16, 16, it is the churches of Christ salute you. So there it's obvious, obvious, folks, that there are local churches churches. There are churches. In fact, even in Romans chapter 16, you find here in verse number, oh, let me find it really quick. I'm looking for it where it says the church that is in their house. Oh man, where is it here? It's right here in Romans 16. Let me find it quickly. Hang on just a second now. I know that it is right here somewhere in these verses. Somebody comment if you can find it. Why am I why am I overlooking this right now? Somebody comment if you can find it's the church that meets in their house or the church that's in their house. Anyway, I know it's in Romans 16 and I am just completely overlooking it right now. But it, oh, there it is, verse 5. Here we go, verse number 5. Likewise greet the church that is in their house. So notice this, the, the church it's in their house. It's not a building. The church is not a building, okay? So there are local churches that meet together, local individual bodies of believers that meet together. That is local churches. Nobody would deny that. Now, the problem comes, though, when we begin to deny the fact that there is a universal church because on the contrary, just like there are local churches, there is also the church. Look at Colossians chapter number 1. Look at Colossians chapter number 1. All right, Colossians chapter number 1. And look there at verse number 24. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Okay, the Bible says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. All right, do you see there very clearly it says that his body is the church. Church, not the church is. How many bodies does Christ have? He has one. There is one church. Guys, he is, look at, look at verse number 18. Verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. There is no way in the world you're going to get around the fact that the body of Christ, the collective group of every saved individual on planet earth, is called the church. There's no way around it. You are, listen man, you are denying scripture if you try to say that the universal, whatever you want to call it, the collective group of believers all around the world is not called the church. It's plain. You're just rejecting the Bible. You're just not reading the Bible and taking it for what it says. Okay? Now, how do you get into this body? Will you get into this body? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. You ready? For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Notice, we're not talking about local assemblies. We're talking about Christ. Is Christ divided, it says in one place, 
It may even be here in this scripture. I can't, I can't remember where exactly that is. It might be 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Is Christ divided? No. So if you try to say that this is Christ, this is the body of 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 Christ, well, you've now just divided, you have now mutilated the body. We are talking about Christ here. So look at verse number 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized, all baptized into one body. You see that there? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. So folks, spiritual baptism, when you get saved, the very moment you get saved, you get baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, okay? You do not get bat- you Listen, you do not join the body of Christ when you get in water, okay? Romans chapter 6, verse number 3 and 4. Know you not that as many of you as were baptized... Uh, in, uh, the, know you not that so many of you were baptized... Oh, man, I'm butchering that. Hang on, let me just read it here. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Listen, you, when you got saved, according to Romans 6, 3, and Romans 6, 3 is not talking about water baptism. You know, we often say, you know, buried with him in baptism, raised, you know, buried with him in baptism, by baptism into death, raised to walk in newness of life. I hear preachers that'll preach that or say that when they're baptizing in water. Romans chapter 6, verse number 3 and 4 has nothing to do with water baptism. When you get baptized into... Listen, that water, our, our baptistry is right up here. That water is not Christ. It's not Christ. When you get baptized into Christ is when you get saved. All right? Is my camera a little, my camera a little spunky there? Is it a little off? I think it's good. Anyway, I may have, I may have tilted it when I was in a big way of, of teaching. All right? So notice, that water is not Christ. So when you get baptized into Christ, when you're buried with Him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, that's not when you get saved, or excuse me, when you get water baptized. That's when you get saved. That is when you get born again. So Romans 6 has nothing to do with water baptism. You get baptized by the Spirit into Jesus Christ. That is why... When John the Baptist is doing his earthly ministry, he says, One's coming after me. I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we see all three baptisms. You see the water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, and then the baptism of fire, which is hell, okay? So understand this. The, the idea of baptizing people so that they can be part of your church. That's not found in the Bible. You become part of the body of Christ by spiritual baptism. Now, if you want to, if you want to, you know, require people to be baptized to join your church, that's your business, okay? But saying that you, if you want to be a member of this church, you've got to be baptized in this church, that's ridiculous, and you can't find that in the Bible, man. But there are Baptist churches all over, and I won't mention names, but even some very you know big dog preachers, whatever you want to call them, who, are, who teach and preach this stuff, and it's junk, and it's not scriptural. Those believers in Acts chapter number 2, when the church started, and I firmly stand upon Acts chapter number 2 when the church started, They are baptized. Look at Acts chapter number 11. Look at Acts chapter number 11. Look at Acts chapter number 11. I'm going to show you that this baptism began the church. Listen, guys, this this may hair lip some of you. You ready? This may hair lip some of you. But the church did not start in, in Matthew 16 when Jesus first mentioned it. Okay? It didn't start there. You know, upon, uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, get listen, the church wasn't built yet. The church hadn't even started yet. Christ had not even died yet. There is no New Testament yet. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.15 that there has to be the death of the testator for a testament to be a force. So there is no, there is no body of Christ yet. There is no New Testament church. Now, so Jesus is talking about it, right? And then in Matthew chapter 18, he even gives you a few rules about it. He even talks about, you know, put them before the church and all that kind of stuff. But the church is not a thing yet. 
So look at Acts chapter number 11 and look there at verse number 15. Now, Acts chapter number 11, they are retelling the story of Cornelius and the boys in Acts chapter number 10, how that they get saved and the Holy Ghost falls on them and all that kind of stuff before they get water baptized. So they're retelling the story of Cornelius. You ready? Watch verse number 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I rem- then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So what happened in Acts chapter number 10? Well, if you look at verses 45 through 48 of Acts chapter number 10, the whole, the, they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's poured out on them. They receive it, and they begin to speak with tongues. That happens in Acts chapter number 2. The Holy Ghost falls on them, they speak in tongues, and they get baptized by the Holy Ghost. That is what they're saying. Listen, it happened to them just like it happened to us in Acts chapter number 2. See that? So what you have here is you have Peter and the boys saying, Listen, we were baptized in Acts 2. These guys got baptized here. So if there is, listen, how do you, according to, remember, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, how do you get put in the body? You get put in the body, the church, you get put into the church, the body of Christ, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that is exactly what happens in Acts chapter number 10. And Peter and them say, what happened to them happened to us. Acts chapter number 2, just eight chapters prior to that. So folks, I didn't spend much time talking about the local churches because there's probably not a person on here that has to be convinced that there are local churches in the Bible. But for some reason, and I'm going to tell you what's what's going on, moving towards the position of being of, of only local church, denying a universal or heavenly or triumphant, whatever terminology you want to call it, denying that is a step away towards dispensationalism It pulls you away from understanding the different ways that God dealt with man, and it takes you towards a once saved the whole way through the whole Bible, looking forward to the cross, looking back towards the cross. Jesus was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, and the disciples were his deacons, and I've heard people say that kind of stuff. Guys, you cannot get Baptist doctrine in that upper room. The disciples went out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Ain't got nothing to do with us. But when you start saying that, the, that there is no universal church, there is no body of Christ, and that there's always been a church, oh, the church in the wilderness, that's a, there's always been a body of Christ, there's always been people baptized, da, da, da. when you start saying that, you get away from right division and you start dabbling into some dangerous doctrine. So take heed, brethren, that you don't get caught up in this junk. I, I believe in the local church. But man, some of these guys are so local church. And what it is, is it, and I'll, I'll end with this, it turns into a dictatorship. That's exactly what it, it turns into a, bless God, this is my local church. You're going to be baptized in this local church. I'm the pastor. I'm this. I'm that. And it turns into a dictatorship. Well, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give you a transfer of, of membership. We're not going to give you a, a letter. A, a, we're not going to send your letter over there. I don't agree with that pastor. I don't agree with this pastor. I don't agree with... Well, you weren't baptized in a Baptist church, so we're not going to... Uh, listen, if a believer, if somebody comes to me and says, Preacher, they give a clear testimony of salvation. They say, Preacher, I'm as saved as the Apostle Paul. They give a clear testimony of salvation. And then they say, you know, but I was baptized in a non-denominational church. They were baptized by immersion in a non-denominational church after they clearly got saved, or a Methodist church. If There, there, are, a few, there are a few Methodists around here that baptized by immersion still. If they were to tell me that, I would not. Now, you do whatever the heck you want to do. I'm not requiring them to get rebaptized. By no means. By no means. But you get all this warlord stuff and all this kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, man, this whole Baptist brighter, landmarkism, whatever you want to call it, denying of the, of the universal church, it leads to all sorts of wild, crazy things. And ultimately, ultimately, it leads into denying any type of spiritual baptism. That's exactly where it leads. And I know guys who every time they see the word baptism in the Bible, 
they put water in there just like, just like the Church of Christ. In fact, the similarities between what the Church of Christ teaches and what these Baptist writers guys teach, and I'm not accusing them of teaching baptismal regeneration, but the way they describe Scripture, the way they interpret verses about baptism and local church and all that kind of stuff, it is eerily similar to Church of Christ. Eerily similar. Well, you know, we, we trace our Baptist succession all the way back to Jesus. No, you don't. Listen, Jesus did not go around starting Baptist churches. If you want to trace your doctrine back to somebody, it's the Apostle Paul. But then again, that just gets way too dispensational for some of these guys. Way too dispensational for some of these guys. And what it is, is they deny right division. They, they see they're just like these water dogs. They're just like the Church of Christ Campbellites. They see church and automatically assume it's local. They see baptism and automatically assume it's water. They don't write. There we go. We're back now. It paused for a second. But this stuff is dangerous, and it will lead you down a heretical road every single time. And I love Baptist history. I believe in Baptist history. I think you ought to study Baptist history. I think, listen, I think some of y'all need to quit getting all these Protestants for your... Some, listen, some of these Protestants weren't even saved, man. John Calvin, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't believe that old boy was saved, just to be real honest. Martin Luther, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, you study their writings, man, there's some heretical stuff in there. I mean, bad, damnable heresies they believed. I believe you ought to get some, get some good, uh, get some good Baptist uh, heroes. We don't preach and teach Baptist history enough in our churches. But on the flip side, you've got to be careful because, you know, you don't want to get in this line of secession and, oh, you can trace our church all the way back to this one. And, oh, if you don't start a church out of another church and if there's not a mother church and all that kind of stuff, you've got to be careful with that stuff, man, because you start sounding like a Catholic and you start sounding like a church of Christ. You've got to be careful when you study that Baptist history and make sure there's a balance. Filter, and, and look, filter everything through the lenses of the Bible, specifically the Pauline epistles, and you'll always be okay. All right, folks, I hope you've... Listen, I, this, this video didn't get a very high live view count because maybe some people don't know the issue. I, listen, I was raised never, ever hearing about the local church only. I didn't know about local church only. I remember as a six, seven-year-old boy at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church out in Weaverville, North Carolina, where I was born and raised, I remember being taught in Sunday school that everybody who saved makes up the church. That there was, I was taught that from a child. It's not an issue around here in the mountains. But I know it's an issue a lot of places, and I know some guys getting caught up in it, and it needs to be taught on, and it needs to be addressed. And so I think that uh, I think this is a time of thing. It didn't get a lot of high view count, but you guys like and share, like and share this. You know, make a, make a brighter mad, amen? Uh, so uh, I think this needs to be taught. I think it needs to be explained. I think people need to understand this because it can lead you down a dark and dangerous road doctrinally, okay? All right, folks, God bless you is my prayer. And uh, I'll probably do another one of these, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, we'll do it a little bit earlier maybe, okay? I may do an, another one tomorrow. So like and share this, and God bless you is my prayer, folks.